one of the early instructions we received from the school, School of Meditation, was when you've nothing to say, don't say anything. <laughs> Which pleased me no end as a young man. <laughs> so we sort of felt I was such a failure that I didn't know what to say in company particularly. And I remember at one party and uh, remembering this instruction and just standing there against a wall and saying nothing and immediately feeling, instead of feeling sort of insecure and you know, sort of wondering what I should should say or who I should speak to, just standing there, mm. listening and looking, and, I, and suddenly I felt sort of safe and um, the effort sort of drained out of it. And actually, I had a nice evening. I think some people said something to me. Maybe anyway, it, it, it all went all right, and uh, and that. Uh, I didn't use words like personal effort, I didn't know what it meant then, but um, I've never forgotten how suddenly I felt a, a door had been opened into an easier way of behaviour. And now I, I often remember, didn't do nothing to say, say nothing. It, it does help, you know. Let the other person say something. And, Which pleases them, of course. They're not interested in you, are they? They're <laughs> interested in themselves. <laughs> of course, one of the aspects of observing, not only listen, but listen to your own voice. That really is, uh, you're getting, it's a bit tricky, but it's quite possible. But I remember very clearly my very first experience of meditation in St. Pancras Station waiting room, late at night, coming home to Bakewell. And it, it sort of opened up for me like that. And first of all, I'd realized I no longer had to climb mountains and find deserts to find the great space I freedom I longed for it was all within me and soon after that I thought well good heavens this must be the kingdom of God it was a dimension that I'd never experienced before it was this infinite this infinite opening up good heavens what is it well, I remember it as clearly now as I did then, so it seems. Oh, I don't know, I'm not, I don't often use that word blissful. I don't think I'm a very sort of blissful sort of person, but it was certainly, <laughs> it was certainly what contemporary people call a wow moment. <laughs> and never having, you know, I don't know, I don't know anybody's got an exact description of what we mean by the Kingdom of God, but uh, I suppose what I mean by it now, because I use the term quite freely now, because yesterday we were talking about um, silence, equals sp silence equals space, equals spirit, equals peace, equals all these other things, infinite love, infinite this and that, and uh, isn't that the kingdom of God? It's the same thing, isn't it? it? Or God, spirit? It is here, isn't it? it it's, this, it's this higher consciousness in which we dwell, but all too often unaware of it. The kingdom of God is indeed, I don't know that that is within in my tummy, but it's certainly within my consciousness, isn't it? Because it is embraced, you know, we recognize it, we all recognize it. So it's within our consciousness, within our I am, what we are, within us. This is the realm where of spirit, of God. What is God? God, of course, is spirit. So where God is, that's the kingdom of God, isn't it? And where is God if not here?
<laughs> no, dear, how can we be separate from God? We can no more be separate from God than separate from the air. <laughs> or, or separate from this room. This is what fills this room. We're in it, aren't we? Like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> chocolates in a box or something. And, um, <laughs> as Phil said, the moment you start talking, you've forgotten it, haven't you? Mm. It's, it's, it's so simple, but... <laughs> well, it, it's a step-by-step -step process. First of all, you know, we feel there's still some remnants of separate existence in us when we first get these experiences. And it's only after many, many, many years of practice that, that, that you lose ever more of that sense of separate existence and actually sort of melt into this completely and forget all about what once upon a time was John Butler. Mm -hmm. We're Jesus in potential, dear, but, yeah. but we've, <laughs> we've, we've still got rather a lot of yeah. I am not Jesus hanging around us. <laughs> <laughs> Look, here's, there's you, here's me, and what's this? What's this that contains us? The third point. Three in one. <laughs> Once we begin to relate it to being present, it's extraordinary, isn't it, how it doesn't seem complicated at all. Yeah, I mean, you yes, you can, the love between, or you and me, or however it's, you know, the details you can fill in. But see, here's duality, one, you and me. The duality is when we miss that third point, and that's when we're incomplete. And you bring in this third point, and suddenly things are contained, aren't they? The discord is contained. Life isn't as bad as we thought. We, we, I might introduce the, uh, the, the pure and impure. Now, what is impurity? Pure being, pure consciousness is free of ego, isn't it? Free of me and mine. This space, this space here is uncluttered, isn't it? It's free. You can sense, sense that it's, it's Empty. It's empty, but it's also the fullness of everything. Pure, pure consciousness, which is another word you can call God, if you like, pure consciousness. Well, we're all into scripture this morning, aren't we? Blessed are the pure in heart. Remember, for they shall see God. You see? Now, <laughs> how often do we see God, perhaps not as rarely as you think. We do actually have moments, perhaps, of perceiving what we may approximately, probably, hazard a guess, it might be. We call God, or we get a sense, blessed are the pure in heart. The moment you start claiming it, or describing it, or we lose it. Can we speak from pure heart? No. Maybe we occasionally say something, occasionally, not often. A clue is if your words are prefaced with I, I think, then you can be certain that you're not speaking with a pure heart. Do you know, I'm editing some letters now. There'll be another book somewhere down the line <laughs> called Mystic Love, which is letters that I wrote to a certain woman over the last 35 years. And in the early days, of course, it was all about I love you. And of course, I didn't realize it at the time. And I thought as she slipped away, the more I emphasise that I love you, 
the better it would be and the more sort of... But of course now I see clearly that it was that very I love you that put love in a prison and was actually the cause of it all going wrong. And now uh, it seems much easier not to say I love you but just look at someone. <laughs> See, it takes a long, long time, doesn't it, to, to uh, perhaps one could say, grow out of impurity like that. Because who, you know, you ask anyone in the street, and I love you is the pinnacle of human experience, isn't it? This is a rather similar state to my first wife, who, who both of them have dementia. And uh, we're, they're both in that fortunate um, state of dementia when the ego is forgotten. They just don't function from the ego any longer. And it's just such a beautiful experience. My wife is, is just pure. Just pure. Just pure. Mm. There are no longer any problems. When we were married, it was end, we were in the struggle with problems. I and me, and I want this, I want to do that. You can't really believe it, can you? People think dementia is the most terrible thing that can happen, but certainly, well, I know it can be grim, but it, certainly in our two cases, it's talk about a blessing in disguise. Now, my dear, oh, bless you, dear, it's, it's such an important thing to say that, and it, it, it absolutely hits the nail on the head, exactly. Yes, this tension between the newly awaking consciousness and the old habits, it can be uh, thrilling, it can be quite terrifying and there's much confusion in between. Um, you begin to see your old self, as it were, from a, a step back. Begin to realise this isn't quite as real as it seems or it's no longer so total as it was. And of course we're not yet sufficiently familiar and confident with the alternative. Yes. Well, dear, in every spiritual tradition, there's a long, long period described as either the spiritual battle, or the spiritual struggle, or something like that. And this is the interplay between these two forces, the forces of the newly awaking soul and the old forces of darkness. And it's just a... You just have to go through, just like when we're young and growing up, you know, you have a long struggle to let go of childhood. Part of you wants to grow up, another part longs to be a baby again. And go through it from youth as we grow up into maturity. And again, in the same problem in old age, you feel your powers decline and yet you long to be able to be a vigorous man again. And it's just like this spiritual, it's a, spirit, it's, a, it's, it's a growth, it's a spiritual journey, a lifelong journey, a lifelong journey, dear. Um, so don't think you can just come to a retreat like this and bingo, go off and be enlightened. It's, it's not real. You're going to go out into the world in a few hours and right bang into the, all the old habits again. And you'll forget this, and then you, a bit of you will remember, and perhaps more of you will forget it. And um, 
oh, the world may seem worse than ever, more difficult than ever, because we've had a glimpse of freedom from it. You know, the darkness is always darkest when you start to move away from it. So you need me to be brave and uh, persist with your practice little by little. Reassure yourself as you can with the sense that God is with us, that this consciousness is actually, you forget it of course, this is the problem, we always forget it, but then we remember again. And it's that memory, that memory is a saving grace. And you cannot remember yourself, you cannot say, I'm going to remember, because you can't, you'll forget. But memory comes in like sh sunshine through the clouds. It's a grace, suddenly the day after day, the the grey clouds and you think it's the end of the world and then a little glimpse of sunshine and suddenly you feel better. That's how memory works. And when you remember, then you must put it into practice. Remember to listen and look and then when you do that, as it were, something else opens, a little chink of light. Then you forget again. But if you sit to meditate, then again you'll Sometimes you, you don't remember at all, you'll just sit there thinking all through meditation. But they may have a moment of another chink of light. So it is, dear, step by step. Again, it's been described to me like, you know, in a winter night, there's street lamps, aren't there? A lamp and then a, a space of darkness. And then there's another light, isn't there? Then another darkness, then another light. That's really how it goes. So this is the, re the practical reality of spiritual progress. Failure, failure, constant failure. I'm no good, I can't do it. And a little bit of encouragement. And back, back again. Two steps forward and one back all the time. So be of good heart, dear. Scripture's full of encouragement, isn't it? Faint not nor fear, the Lord is near. He faileth not, and thou art dear. You are loved. And it's this love that calls you home. But you're also a naughty girl. And you, <laughs> you strayed away from home. <laughs> and he's like pulling a dog on a lead. He pulls <laughs> and you pull the other way. 